Now I'd like to welcome a dear friend and the co-author of our latest book, Cells Are the New Cure. He's a veteran health science journalist from CBS New York and has been on the board of STEM for Life and the Cura Foundation for the past 10 years. He's a man who can make complex science understandable and synthesize and explain data and its relevance in a way that non-scientists can understand and find interesting. Please welcome Dr. Max Gomez. Good morning, good morning everyone. We are going to hear some very exciting things this morning as you've already begun to hear. As you've heard this morning, our mission for this conference is to unite decision makers and researchers to encourage multidisciplinary collaboration to help grow healthy communities around the world. Our first panel this morning brings together four such thought leaders who will address some of our most pressing global disease challenges as you'll see in this video. Nineteen eighteen, one hundred years ago, a devastating war is at last coming to an end. But amid the celebrations, a shadow is spreading. A deadly virus that would infect a third of the global population. Called the Spanish flu, it claimed more lives than the war itself. 20 to as many as 40 million people perished in every corner of the world. Today, influenza is still a threat, but vaccines are now available to combat it and other dreaded diseases. Smallpox is gone. Polio and measles are greatly diminished. And while communicable diseases continue to wreak havoc, exacerbated by natural disasters, inadequate infrastructure, and air travel, allowing infection to hop from country to country within hours, for the first time in history, more people are dying of non-communicable diseases than infectious disease, which has led the World Health Organization to form a new high-level commission, comprised of heads of state and ministers, leaders in health and development, and entrepreneurs. The group will propose bold and innovative solutions to accelerate prevention and control of the leading killers on the planet, non-communicable diseases. NCDs kill more than 36 million people each year. Globally, that's seven in every 10 deaths, and some 80% of all non-communicable disease deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. They include type 1 diabetes, which has been rising sharply since the middle of the 20th century. Combined with the ever-increasing incidence of type 2 diabetes, the World Health Organization reports the number of people with this disease has gone from 108 million in 1980 to 422 million in 2014. Cancer continues to be a leading cause of mortality worldwide, linked to one in six deaths. 70% of those deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. Iron deficiency anemia is a public health condition of epidemic proportions the most common and widespread nutritional disorder in the world. The WHO says 2 billion people, over 30% of the world's population, are anemic, many due to iron deficiency. This condition can lead to maternal deaths, poor pregnancy outcomes, impaired physical and cognitive development, and increased risk of morbidity in children. But the world's biggest killer continues to be the group of ailments known as CVDs, cardiovascular diseases. They are responsible for 31% of all deaths worldwide. Three out of four of these deaths occur in economically challenged countries, where people are less able to access effective detection, preventative care, and emergency treatment. Still, the loss of human life from NCDs spares no one, rich or poor, young or old, and it imposes heavy economic costs on nations. Yet non-communicable diseases are often preventable through effective and relatively low-cost interventions that tackle risk factors shared by many of them. As laid out in the WHO Best Buys publication, these include reducing tobacco use, improving unhealthy diets, increasing physical activity, and reducing the harmful use of alcohol. If the major risk factors for NCDs were eliminated, about three-quarters of heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes would be prevented, and 40% of cancer would also be prevented. 
The scientific and social responses to public health crises in the last century prove that humanity is capable of meeting the needs of the next. Discoveries and advances now being made could transform the future if we unite to cure. The need for a global health care initiative is now more urgent than ever. We are fortunate this morning to have several distinguished experts with us who I know will address how we can impact the health challenges the World Health Organization has laid out, beginning with our children. So please welcome Dr. Ronald DePino, Dr. Gina Astriatiru, it's close, Dr. Michael Farku, and Dr. Richard Derman. And so we'll begin this morning with Dr. DePino, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gomez, uh, Dr. Smith, your eminence. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Life is a gift from God, but health is a human responsibility. The message that I have is a very simple one, and that is that the seeds of cancer are planted during childhood, making it a child care responsibility for all of us. So listed here are the great four diseases, and these diseases escalate dramatically as a function of age. Uh, the risk of Alzheimer's is 45% by age 85. For cancer, it's about 40% by age 80. As we just heard in the previous uh, discussion, there's been a near doubling of life expectancy by 2025, we anticipate that there will be 1.2 billion individuals over the age of 60, experiencing a dramatic increase in the incidence of these diseases. In the United States alone, because of the changing demographics, we anticipate a 50% increase in cancer by 2030. So uh, we also have a very significant societal and economic impact. With respect to cancer, one in two men, one in three women will experience cancer in their lifetime. We also know that cancer will claim 100 million lives over the next decade. And it has an enormous economic impact, three trillion at least globally per year, a generational impact of $100 trillion worldwide. Fortunately, Cancer has one vulnerability, and that is knowledge. Up to 50% of cancers can be prevented. And thanks to science, we have a lot of understanding of what illuminates uh, cancer. Uh, tobacco is the single most important cause, responsible for 20% of all deaths, 30% of all cancer deaths. Excessive UV exposure, particularly during childhood, is a major instigator of a lethal skin cancer known as melanoma. Childhood obesity can also result in increased uh, cancers of the uterus, amongst others. And there are, are cancer-causing viruses uh, that extract a very significant toll. Two of them are listed here, hepatitis B virus, but also human papillomavirus, which causes 600,000 cancer cases throughout the world every single year. Uh, and is responsible for development of cervical cancer, throat cancer, amongst other cancers. So there's much that we can do. We tend to think of cancer as a disease of the aged. However, the opportunity to prevent cancer starts during childhood. Uh, let's begin with tobacco. Tobacco uh, is uh, the real major public health problem. It will claim one billion premature deaths over the next century. Uh, the important thing to appreciate is that most adult smokers start as children. Uh, this is Big Tobacco's effort to really get the customer, uh, lifelong customers. More than 95% of adult smokers start before the age of 21. There are many things that we know we can do uh, that require the collective action, both on the policy side as well as the treatment side, such as cessation. Uh, just one example is raising the age of purchase to 21, which would lead to a 10% reduction in uh, both use and death. And tobacco treatment programs have enormous success. Self-quit is only 6%. Tobacco treatment programs up to 45% success rate. In the case of UV, uh, we have uh, excessive exposures 
two skin peeling sunburns or use of tanning beds uh, can double the risk of melanoma decades later. There's been a 700% increase in melanoma in women because of the culture of tanning. Uh, but here again, there are important opportunities in policy and education, tanning bed laws to prevent minors from access to tanning beds, uh, K-12 educational opportunities and sun protection, and just annual skin exams can dramatically reduce death from melanoma by catching it at early curable stages. In the area of vaccines, I want to highlight one in particular, which is HPV. This has been a dream come true that we have a safe and effective vaccine that can prevent a lot of pain and suffering. 85% of those with HPV-associated cancers occur in the impoverished, the forgotten. Uh, and in the United States alone, there are 40,000 cancers that result from HPV. We have a safe and effective vaccine given to many millions. Two shots, optimally at age 11, can prevent up to 90% of HPV-associated cancers. And it's critical that we educate pediatricians and parents alike. This would be the equivalent of not recommending a colonoscopy of an internist for a 50-year-old. This is a critical opportunity that pediatricians, parents have to get behind. In the area of obesity, we have much we can do. Uh, exercise, just 15 minutes of exercise per day increases your life expectancy by three years and reduces the incidence of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and Alzheimer's by 14%. Uh, management of chronic unrelenting stress and also uh, maintaining good BMI through proper diet. And with kids, it's about avoiding sugary drinks. So I have uh, two major areas and just only three major recommendations that would have a profound impact on cancer incidence. In the area of public policy, raising the age of purchase to 21, coupled with raising taxes and smoke-free would have a profound impact on use. Tanning bed legislation should be on the federal level. And we also have important opportunities to increase access to HPV vaccination and make it free. Uh, the cost of getting those cancers are much, much greater. Those are just three examples of what we can do collectively as governments, faith-based organizations, education systems, philanthropists, care delivery systems, and so on. It will take our collective effort. In the area of education, we have one of the greatest platforms, K through 12, that can create curriculum in areas of diet, exercise, and sun protection, where there has been a very significant impact already for such programs. We need to educate those with cancer risk, understand your personal risk, as was mentioned in the earlier uh, session. Uh, we have uh, SMAC technology, social, mobile, artificial intelligence, and cloud that can transform our knowledge of our own health and what we should be doing uh, to, to mitigate our risk. And then we need to educate pediatricians and parents on the importance of HPV vaccination and other instigators of cancer. So when we think about um, impacting the cancer problem globally, there are really two domains. One is on the personal level. The other one is on the public health level, a policy level. And here on the personal level, there are many things that we can do to improve our health and well-being that are listed here. And these are common sense things uh, that we can discuss in the Q&A. And then also on the population level, policy, education, and community services have a huge impact. And the impact is greatest on the underserved, the less fortunate. So I'll end here with a quote from Hippocrates, the function of protecting and developing health must rank even above that of restoring it when it is impaired. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Let me, let me just ask a, a quick question because I'm not sure that people understand or, or realize that uh, we have for the first time a vaccine that can actually prevent cancer. It's a huge accomplishment. So why aren't the vaccination rates any, any greater? It's a matter of understanding and education. And when you educate parents and pediatricians, healthcare professionals, uh, they all come around. It's, it's remarkable. But about 15% of the population doesn't know that the vaccine exists. About 30% don't realize that boys as well as girls need it. Uh, about 15 to 20% think the vaccine is unsafe, which has been proven not to be the case. 
Uh, and then about another 15 or 20 percent thinks it promotes sexual promiscuity, and that has also been proven false. And my three children received the vaccine at age 11. They didn't even understand why they're getting the vaccine, but I now know that I do not have to worry that when they reach 35 or 40, I will not be having a deathbed conversation with them as a parent. So it's education. Education. The power is in the knowledge. Very good. Let's move on here. We're going to go to Dr. Gina Agiostradidou. Did I get it? Yes. Can I call you Dr. Gina from now on? Just, okay. just Gina. Thank you. Just Gina. <laughs> Please. Hello, everybody. Um, oh, yes, this is me. We are all here because we would like to have a healthy life for us, for our loved ones, for everyone. And I'm not talking about reversing, I'm not talking about stopping a disease. I'm talking about a complete prevention of diseases. We know that we have used vaccines for a very long time. We have eradicated many childhood diseases. We just heard about the HP vaccine that prevents HPV-related cancers, 90%. That's, that's really amazing. We know that diseases from that they are uh, created by our lifestyle, like uh, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, or uh, cancer, we can prevent them by changing our lifestyle, by eating healthy, by exercising, by not smoking, as we heard. But what about diseases that we do not know how they develop, like type 1 diabetes? Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Our body attacks the cells that produce insulin. It's random, and the first signs of autoimmunity appear in very early life. People with type 1 diabetes, they need to inject themselves every day. Type 1 diabetes is a relentless disease. It's the only disease I know where parents, caregivers, and patients, they have to make decisions for a drug that they can, it can kill them. And they have to do this every day, multiple times a day, for the rest of their lives, without the benefit of a clinician. This is one disease. If we multiply this by 10,000, there are 10,000 diseases out there. 10,000 diseases that will have a handful of, of treatments. Diseases that for most of them we do not know how they develop. We do not know how to prevent them. We are so happy to share with you that we have a tool that we can start understanding how disease develop. We have one global platform that they can help us start understanding how diseases develop. And everything starts with one little drop of blood. Before I tell you about this, about this platform, I would like to share with you the vision of the Helmsley Charitable Trust. At the Helmsley Charitable Trust, we are a private foundation. And as a private foundation, we have the obligation and the opportunity to fund projects that they can change lives, projects that they are innovative, probably they don't have a lot of preliminary data. It may take a very long time until we have a result, but if they are successful, it can change people's lives. A project like that is GPAD, the Global Platform for Prevention of Autoimmune Disease. GPAD is a clinic network that we can uh, genetically screen individuals and conduct studies and trials. We want to be global. At the moment, it operates among five countries. GPAD uh, genetically screen individuals uh, from in the general population and newborns <laughs> because we believe that most diseases, like type 1 diabetes, it's random, and it happens very early in life. 
how the type 1 diabetes program of the Helmsley Trust is using GPAD, we are trying to uh, assess if oral insulin, for example, can prevent type 1 diabetes. In order to do this trial, we have to screen 300,000 newborns. We have started already, we started in September. We, ex we hope to screen about 100,000 newborns per year. So why such a high number? Because the frequency of the genetic risk associated to, with type 1 diabetes is 1%. So from the 300,000 newborns, we will have 3,000 newborns who have the genetic risk for type 1 diabetes. We expect one-third of, of the parents to accept to participate in the oral insulin trial. And we will end up with 1,000 newborns. This uh, effort started about two years ago and is going to last another eight. It's an investment of 50, $54 million. And that's the beginning. This is a proof of concept. Our vision is that this platform, it will go beyond type 1 diabetes. We will be able to study other autoimmune diseases, other childhood diseases. We, we want to see, we, we want to use this little drop of blood to study 10, 50, 100 diseases. I want all of you to think the limitless possibilities. I want to invite you, I want to ask you, to think if this platform, it can be useful for you, for the, 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 for the diseases you care about. This platform can offer you resources, tools, expertise. I'm asking you to unite with us because prevention is a very, very difficult and complicated effort. I'm asking you to unite because we all want a life without disease. Thank you very much. Gina, this. Gina, this is, uh, uh, as, as Ron said, many of these non-communicable diseases have risk factors that are lifestyle related that we can control. This is one where it is not a lifestyle uh, issue. So beyond type 1 diabetes, what else might GPAD be able to impact and what kind of a, uh, implication does that have for public health? I think the GPAD, as I said, the GPAD platform gives access to so many people, so many newborns, any disease that has a genetic component, but we do not know the environmental factors, it can be the beginning of understanding other autoimmune diseases, other childhood diseases. I strongly believe that prevention can be, it has to be a public, public health affair. I believe that we can if we change our lifestyles, if we start studying diseases, one day everybody can have and lead a healthy life. Cost would be an issue, however, to, and that's why we're in, you're in developed countries mm -hmm. here initially, but that's a big, that would be a big deal uh, going forward. How do you expand that? I think cost, you know, if you prevent diseases, there is no cost for treatments. <laughs> Uh, uh, in all our actual projects, uh, we do a cost, e e e cost effectiveness. Uh, it's very important for us to know that whatever we support, and even with the GPAD, we ensure that they can be expanded, it can be scaled up. And when we thought about scale up, we need to use governments, authorities, everyone. And not only in developing countries, we really think about uh, type 1 diabetes beyond developing countries. We think about countries in sub-Saharan Africa that don't have access, you know, to insulin. Uh, we are trying to think beyond what we have in front of us. Uh, we live in a global world and we have to think beyond what we know. And I think we can do that only if we all united for, for you know, for a very simple cause. Exactly. I think our message today is to think big throughout the entire throughout the entire conference. Our next presenter is Dr. Michael Farku, who is going to speak to us about cardiovascular diseases. Michael. Thank you for having me. It's a great privilege to be here and talk about the number one killer, cardiovascular disease, worldwide. And our community has come together over the last several decades to make an impact on this important disease process. And I'm going to focus on coronary artery disease, but we need out-of-the-box thinking. 
We have huge challenges, and as this epidemic uh, ex is extended to low and middle income countries, we're facing huge global challenges. When we talk about the challenges, we face individual patients. This picture really illustrates what we face in our clinics. We have folks that are sedentary, physical inactivity, dietary indiscretion. And there are also psychological factors that are at play here. And I've always wondered why would someone take the time and effort to put a dog on a treadmill when it's so much easier to go on the treadmill themselves. And these are the challenges we face. And I want to highlight one important feature that comes out of this as well, which is the lack of adherence and compliance to the therapies that we prescribe. So we're dealing with humans and human challenges, and I think that has to be at the forefront of all of our recommendations. Coronary heart disease has known traditional risk factors. We know them, cigarette smoking, elevated total cholesterol, and LDL cholesterol, which we call the bad cholesterol, and low HDL cholesterol, which is what we term the good cholesterol, hypertension, and a family history of premature cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease. And of course, age, which is a non-modifiable risk factor, all at play. But there are other risk factors that are now emerging. Of course, we've talked about obesity and the, the role of central obesity, abdominal and visceral obesity in this epidemic, physical inactivity, which is uh, a global challenge, and the role of inflammation. And later today, Dr. Peter Libby, who's a luminary in this field, will be addressing this role of inflammation in our disease process. Now, we have challenges in the United States, and I want to just look over the last 20 years, from 1994 to 2014. We've had almost a doubling, if you look at the color scheme, a doubling in the risk of obesity and the top panel prevalence and in the prevalence of diabetes. This happened over 20 years. So we can talk about genetic factors and environmental factors, but this may have happened because of one issue, which was public health policy. The Framingham study many years ago showed us that diets high in saturated fat would be linked to cardiovascular disease, and policies were made to have low-fat diets. Well, what did we substitute for low-fat diet? High-carbohydrate diet. So maybe our, the best of intentions with health policy changes may have led to an epidemic that we have, particularly in the United States and in the developed world. In 2011, the United Nations convened a commission on non-communicable diseases, and my colleagues have alluded to uh, these uh, measures from the World Health uh, Organization, which targeted a reduction of non-communicable diseases by 25% by the year 2025, which is a huge goal, but if achievable, would make monumental progress. And we talked about uh, these factors, including accelerated tobacco control, reducing dietary salt consumption, treating patients at high risk for cardiovascular disease, reducing alcohol consumption, and reducing physical inactivity. And my colleague, Ava Grunfeld, who is here today, has designed a program that tackles non-communicable diseases as a totality in terms of interventions that we can implement in the clinic so that we can tackle not only the risk factors for cardiovascular disease, but the common risk factors for cancer, neurodegenerative disease, and the development of diabetes. Now, there are global challenges. Low- and middle-income countries are moving from rural, uh, rural populations, moving to higher urban settings, urbanization. The example of the Grenada Heart Project, which we instituted a few years back with the World, Health, World Heart Federation, you can see that over 25 years, the island of Grenada changed 100,000 people that we've been monitoring for cardiovascular risk factors and for the development of coronary heart disease. And what we're seeing is increasing risk factors, particularly hypertension and obesity as people become urbanized. We haven't yet seen the epidemic of the heart disease, the myocardial infarction or heart attacks, strokes coming, but that's the wave, the tsunami, that if we don't stop it in these countries, we're going to face insurmountable challenges. Now, we can eliminate coronary artery disease, at least in concept, if we can reduce LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol in our blood, to levels that we had at the neonatal uh, time in our lives. And if we look at autopsy series from both Alaska and Kenya, in populations that have low LDL levels, these autopsies did not show coronary heart disease. People died of myocarditis or inflammation of the heart, valvular disease, and other thrombotic disorders. So we know that there's the promise with newer therapies, with dietary interventions, we'll hear about just a later today, as well as pharmacologic interventions that we can lower LDL cholesterol and potentially eliminate coronary artery disease if implemented early in life. 
The Columbia Children's Project is an out-of-the-box project that was developed by my colleague, Valentin Fuster, who's also my mentor. And Valentin, in collaboration with Sesame Street, had the concept that if we educate children in the preschool years, we could stem these, this tide of, of coronary heart disease in these individuals. And this is in a time when physical education programs are being curtailed in school. And we're not focusing on children, we're focusing on disease. So this visionary program, in partnership with, again, the Sesame Foundation, Sesame Street Foundation, uh, intervened on children. And what we learned was something just so dramatic. Not only did we educate the children, but we changed the teachers, we changed the parents. Could children go home and they, they don't want to have the same diet. They want to have carrots and vegetables and things that they learn about. They want to go for a walk with their parents. And parents are changed by their children. So as a primary prevention platform, this out-of-the-box thinking may have huge public health implications. We've just expanded the program now to Harlem and Dr. Fuster's program in Spain is well developed. And I'd like to end by something that may be a very unrecognized risk factor, and this is adverse childhood adversity. And this is when children grow up in war-torn countries when they're neglected or in a, uh, a home where there are issues. And these can have lasting biologic, mental health, and behavioral effects. And I don't think we even understand this, and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Christine Lay and Dr. Catherine Kriatsoulis, have taught us that by screening in populations, particularly in a migraine clinic, we recognize that up to 80% of people had adverse childhood events. We don't even ask about these in our clinics, and we don't even know how to address it. So interventions and cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness for folks to understand what they went through uh, as a child may have implications long-term in their adult life. Very, very important. So I'd like to close by saying that we have a huge epidemic in front of us, particularly in vulnerable populations, in our indigenous populations, and in low- and middle-income countries. These risk factors are increasing at alarming rates in those countries and also in children and youth. We need to intervene early in the life cycle and, and implement primary prevention strategies on a health policy level, and it all begins with education, as Ron pointed out. Thank you very much. So, Michael, as you pointed out, we have interventions. We have pharmacological therapies that can lower LDL. We have behavioral interventions that have some impact. What's the low-hanging fruit, if you will? Where do we go first? What, what's going to give us the most bang for our buck to at least get started towards that 2025 goal? Well, I think, uh, obviously, we talked about tobacco, uh, tobacco issues and uh, restricting tobacco use. Very big. The dietary interventions are huge. But I think one of the biggest issues we have, because we have these interventions and we know about it, the science is well developed, uh, I think there are two fronts. One is compliance and adherence of patients to these interventions. What makes people have a sedentary lifestyle when they know what they have to do and they're looking for the magic bullet? So it all lies, in, to me, in lifestyle. And we have, to, we have to enforce this. We have to work in our workplace and in our homes to try to enforce that. So that's number one. Number two is, I think, novel pathways of risk and the whole inflammatory paradigm may be ways and in adverse childhood events, other risk factors that we've never tackled. Because we know we have huge re residual risk, even if we have the best of adherence and compliance to our known therapies. So you're saying behavioral Modification is Absolutely. the low-hanging fruit? I, I, I think that ways in which we can encourage people and, ch and have out-of-the-box thinking is the way to go. It's not easy. Exactly. But I don't, exactly. think, I don't think if we look for the magic bullet in pharmacotherapy or devices, I think we're going to fall short. True, because people will keep looking for that as, as their safety net instead of behavior modification. Absolutely. And just to be clear, we're not talking about taking away my glass of Italian vino at dinner. No. I think uh, alcohol consumption, it's interesting, there's a U-shaped curve for alcohol consumption. Mm. So actually moderate alcohol consumption, a drink or a few drinks in a week, very healthy and, and for cardiovascular health. The problem is in cancer risk, it's a linear relationship between alcohol consumption and cancer risk. So okay. we have to know your own personalized approach 
you have cancer history in your family, you avoid alcohol. If you have heart history, you do what Max is doing. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard Derman, who is going to speak to us about something that I uh, have to confess I was not aware of was such a massive worldwide public health problem, uh, iron deficiency. Dr. Derman. So you're not alone, Max. Uh, and, and it's very exciting to hear about new advances in cancer prevention, in heart disease prevention, uh, in diabetes, and type 1 diabetes. And it's very hard to get excited about something like anemia, which we talk about every single day, and which goes back to the earliest stages of mankind. We knew that iron was important from the very early days of mythology. And so I asked myself, how do I convince this group that anemia is so, so important. So all of us, except our hosts here from the Vatican, got on an airplane to come here. And we had sort of a hope that when we got on the airplane, this wouldn't be happening. And fortunately, it doesn't happen very often. When a jumbo jet goes down, you hear about it for weeks at a time, public awareness goes up, it's noted in every single newspaper around the world, and 300 or 400 people die. So no one should die from getting on an airplane, certainly not to go to this conference. Similarly, nobody should die giving birth. No woman should be subjected to death or morbidity because they simply want to have a child. And yet, every single day, two jumbo jets go down. In the 10 minutes that I have allotted to me, five women are going to die uh, during the course of childbirth. And we know that 90% of this is actually preventable. So we know why women die. There are no secrets here. 80% of women die in childbirth from three conditions. Severe bleeding, which is postpartum hemorrhage, increased blood pressure, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and infection. Very, very simple. And we can go ahead and correct 90% of this. But when we look around in terms of correcting this, we ask ourselves, is there a common thread? Just as we're going to hear later in, in this discussion, the importance of inflammation. Well, the common thread, in fact, may be anemia. Just last month in The Lancet, there was a report showing that anemia in pregnancy doubles the risk of death. This was a major finding. Those of us who worked in the field really felt that, but it was nice to see this published. Anemia in pregnancy, in fact, is a contributor or sole cause of 20 to 40% of all maternal deaths. And yet about 42% of all pregnant women suffer from anemia. All of disability, about 9% of total disability in, in the world is related to anemia. So we know that the lower the hemoglobin, the worse the pregnancy outcome, not only for the mother, but for the baby as well. So there's an increase in postpartum hemorrhage. There's an increase in cesarean section rates. There's an increase in sepsis infection. In the newborns, if many, many stillbirths occur because of anemia. There's an increase in prematurity. And you know, prematurity is the leading cause of death in children under the age of five. What's more recent, is the fact that these children who are born with anemia and other micronutrient deficiencies have decreased cognitive performance, decreased physical growth, uh, increase in behavioral deficits, and this is something that we need to address, especially areas like cerebral palsy. So the iron demands in pregnancy go up. They're increased two to three-fold in terms of what we usually take in our body. Part of it is because the fluid volume has increased. We have to support the growing fetus, especially in the second half of pregnancy. And we have to account for the blood loss that occurs at delivery. Ferritin is a protein that we now know stores iron and releases it in a controlled fashion. And I only mention ferritin for one reason. We've just discovered recently that if you go too low in ferritin levels, the baby's brain does not get enough iron. If the baby's brain doesn't get enough iron, the child has neurocognitive developments, and even if you give iron and make the baby replete, the change may be irreversible. So we need to go ahead and intervene early in the game. Iron intake, you would think it's very simple. Take an iron pill. 
Just take an iron pill, it's a good thing to do when one is pregnant. The problem is that women don't do it because the side effects and the GI effects for the women in the room who've taken iron, you know that it doesn't work. The absorption is not very, very good and adherence isn't good. And if you have severe anemia, you cannot catch up with oral iron. So I borrowed this slide from Bailey because I think it's very important. We just recreate the wheel. There's a giant circle. It's an intergenerational impact. If you have a low birth weight baby and you have impaired mental development and increased risk of chronic disease, as that baby enters childhood, they're gonna have more frequent infections. They're gonna have inadequate growth. There's gonna be a higher mortality rate if they live and they begin to have menstrual periods, they're going to lose more blood. They're gonna become stunted. They move into adulthood, ready to give birth, and already they're anemic, and the situation continues uh, right around in this circular fashion. So we need to intervene. We've had a 40-year history, and we've made no changes. In fact, the condition seems to be getting worse. So one new approach, which we're beginning, is the use of IV iron. It seems very simple. But until recently, we didn't have formulations that we could give a single infusion at the end of the second trimester or beginning of the third trimester. And so what we need to determine, and we know this from studies that have gone on in Europe and the United States, that we can correct some of the anemias. We will be able to correct the severe anemias. We need to do this study. We need to follow these babies and make certain that the neurocognitive changes do not occur. And now there are four different formulations out there, and we need to work with our manufacturers to determine which is the best one, which will give us public sector pricing, who will give us the drug free of charge to go ahead and move forward with this agenda. So the Brits are well ahead of the Americans in this regard. We are behind in preterm birth. We're behind in maternal mortality. And the British Blood Transfusion Society says very simply, if your hemoglobin level is under eight grams per deciliter, uh, and, it's, and you should go ahead and use IV iron. If you have newly diagnosed anemia after 34 weeks, use IV iron. And women who cannot take oral iron ought to consider IV iron. So let's get on the bandwagon. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to just quote from Ernest Yeboa, a very famous thinker and philosopher from Ghana. He said, we fail to open the right doors because we fail to pick the right keys. I think we know what the keys are. It's just a matter of doing it the right way. And if we do that, if we rely on simulation, on checklists, on team training, we'll all have a happy and safe landing. And we're going to go ahead and hope that the women that we serve and the babies that are born can reach their full potential. Thank you. Richard, just so you know, we have an audience full of very nervous flyers, so you have not, you've not helped very many people here today. Let me ask you, so would the approach or the strategy be to try oral iron first? Yes, it is. And, and oral iron works well. We've learned more and more that oral iron doesn't get absorbed in the third trimester of pregnancy, that we're pro not dosing it properly. Women don't take it. But we need to go ahead and get a baseline hemoglobin and ferritin level early in pregnancy. We need to repeat it at 28 weeks. And if we find that those levels are too low, we need to intervene in a different manner because what we've done in the past simply hasn't worked. And you mentioned ferritin being a key here. What do we do if, if there's not enough ferritin to, to transport the iron? Well, you've got, to go, you've got to go ahead and raise the hemoglobin levels. And the ferritin is just a transfer protein that allows the iron to go ahead and be distributed appropriately and at the right time. But you said if, that, that if the ferritin level gets too low, well, then it's all a, the iron... It's a, it's a good clue to the total iron store in the body. So if you have ah. low levels, you know that you're dealing with very low iron stores. Got it. All right, we're going to come back to another question there. But let me, Ron, let me come back to you uh, here for, for a question. Cost is always going to be an issue, and particularly if we are going to push therapies out to a, much, to a global population. 
Let's talk about what, what you mentioned here, the HPV uh, vaccine. Uh, not cheap or not inexpensive. Give me a, a, a cost comparison here. Okay, so two shots. Two shots, uh, upper end $300. Uh, 4.4 million 11-year-olds in the United States. Uh, so that's about 1.3 billion. Uh, the cost for managing 17,000 cervical cancer cases and 23,000 head and neck cancer cases is in the neighborhood of about three to four billion. So not only is it cheaper, but you reduce the pain and suffering of the disease but we still have to come up with that money up front somehow. Is there a way to reduce that cost, that upfront cost of the vaccines? Well, there are uh, currently trials underway to see if one vaccination would be sufficient. Uh, so that's gonna have a profound impact worldwide. Uh, the uh, three, $150 per shot is the upper end. It's, it, you know, there could be uh, ways to mitigate that. Uh, so distribution, access, uh, there are levels of efficiencies that could drive the cost down further. Uh, but this is uh, one of those no-brainer investments uh, that you don't see the benefit of uh, until another 15 years down the road. Uh, but it does have a profound impact and a disproportionately positive impact on those that cannot get treated. It's important to appreciate, as you mentioned, 70 percent of the cancer cases occur in low and middle income countries. 25% of those cancers are the result of viruses agents for which we have therapies, vaccination. So hepatitis B, HPV, 25%. And those, those countries, if you get cancer, there is no treatment option. Prevention is critical. Got it. Dr. Ajio Stradiru. Oh. Yes? Even better. I just got a drink. I earned a drink out of that one, by the way. <laughs> Tell me about, so the, the, the key with GPAD is uh, we, you have or we know uh, what the genes are that will put an individual child at risk for type 1 diabetes, correct? Correct. In order to expand this to other uh, autoimmune diseases, which would be a huge accomplishment. We need to identify the genes that put them at risk for that. Where are we in that? I think there are many autoimmune diseases and other childhood diseases that they have a genetic component. It's not the only uh, factor that can push to a disease. But I think what we, our vision is that we create this platform and, and as I said, we invite everyone who has a disease that can use this uh, platform because it's the beginning of understanding and since we have this commitment, the, the Helmsley has commitment to support this platform beyond this, this trial, beyond the 300,000 uh, newborns, we believe that if we bring other diseases, we know autoimmune diseases, for example, they probably start, they have something in common. And then as they move forward, as they develop, they have different clinical, uh, clinical outcomes. But probably there, are, there is a, a common thread. There's some common, common and then, uh, so in a, in a sense, diabetes is the proof of concept exactly, for exactly. all of this. Of Terrific, thank you. So Michael, we talked a little bit earlier, what can we learn in prevention and cardiovascular diseases? What can we learn from other fields, breaking down the silos, if you will. Are there lessons that we can then apply from other fields? Yeah, well, what, what, we've, what we've learned is that the risk factors for cancer, neurocognitive decline, and cardiovascular disease are aligned with each other, the tobacco, the obesity, and so on, and diabetes. And so what we have to do is understand in our, in our clinics, for example, taking it to the, right to the patients, that if someone has cancer, they're at risk for cardiovascular disease as well. So we, we learn from each other in aligning our clinics. So what many, we, do, we are creating multidisciplinary clinics now. There's an interesting field, and I don't know if Dr. Libby will mention on what's called clonal hematopoiesis, which is an abnormality in the blood that may lead to malignancy of the blood. 
uh, later in life. It's also linked to potential higher risk for cardiovascular disease. So are we screening patients for these novel risk factors and understanding how they all are intertwined? So we're talking about prevention at that point. Mm -hmm. In terms of the treatments, uh, many of our treatments, for example, for cancer have implications on the, on the cardiovascular system. So the idea that we work together, I think, both in prevention and in therapy is the, is the way forward. So the point of care is an access, not just if they're coming in for their exactly. blood pressure. That's a, that's a real opportunity to access a lot of different right. issues. Right. So these novel, are we, are we addressing the stress in their life, the adverse childhood events from, that have risk for all of these diseases? And are, we, are these patients at higher risk for their accompanying disorders? Very, very interesting. Thank you, Michael. Richard, finally, these new IV formulations, are they essentially a, a time-release iron? Is that how no, they work? No, actually, one can give these iron formulations in as short a period as giving an entire gram in 15 minutes. We've seen no major adverse events reported, which is different than the early IV iron formulations that many physicians have used and get concerned about. And so there's a wariness to it, but we haven't seen any of these reports in the studies in Europe and in the United States. So we're very optimistic. And, and patients don't often come if they're in rural areas. I work in India. If they're in rural areas, it's hard for them to come for prenatal care. If one can give a single dosing at that point of the end of the second or beginning of the th third trimester, rather than going ahead and monitoring whether they're taking oral iron, we will stay ahead of the curve. And is that doable in rural areas, underdeveloped countries? I That's believe it is. And we, we've talked about the cost effectiveness here. We're not talking about thousands of dollars. We're talking about a minimum amount of investment to get a very, very dramatic return on that investment. Terrific. I want to thank our, our panel here. I think we have plenty of uh, food for thought, as it were. And we're only going to expand on that over the next two and two and a half days. So thank you all and thank you panel.